Is this for application of the room? Yes, it's, it's, it's uh, uh, both. Welcome. So without any ceremony whatsoever, <laughs> my name is Tom Tresser, and I'm an organizer and educator and public defender. And I'll let you figure out what that means. I've been in Chicago since 1980, raising trouble for almost 40 years in the city of Chicago. The topic that I'd like to share with you on technology and social change and community organizing is encapsulated in this pamphlet, which is a product of the TIFF Illumination Project out of the Civic Lab. And the Civic Lab is a space for collaboration between organizers, educators, coders, and graphic designers to make new tools for civic engagement, to accelerate social change. And this is a tool from our Civic Factory. Much thanks uh, to Joe and Norma and all the good folks at uh, the Institute for Policy and Civic Engagement uh, for printing these wonderful documents for us and for the community. So let's talk tips, shall we? Um, first of all, who knows what a tax increment financing district is? Show of hands. Who knows what a tip is? Who knows what a tip is? So we're looking like maybe half of the hands are raised. So let us fly quickly through that because it is important that you have a little bit of understanding of what a tip is. So the big picture. Uh, TIFs are a creature created by a city inside the state of Illinois to do economic development in blighted areas uh, where, the, where, the, where, the, where the market would not normally go. Uh, and how, how a community gets blighted could be a, a whole other day, and who blighted who, you know, is a pretty incendiary conversation, but that is the word that we're going to be using. And the other th factor about TIPS is this money, which is a gift to developers from your property taxes, is only supposed to be used when there's no other recourse, or what they call the but for. Uh, possibility. So that is to say, um, but for this money, this project would not happen. And these things last for 23 years. And when a TIF is created to help a project, uh, a boundary is uh, drawn around the properties. A snapshot is taken of all the properties inside the TIF, and it, the uh, amount of property tax generated by those properties is noted. That is called the base. And the four factors which uh, are supposed to influence blight are these. Um, and yet, somehow, they put a TIF district in the central business district of the city of Chicago and on LaSalle Street. So I'm not quite sure how the word blight is being interpreted, but there you have it. Uh, this is a complicated diagram about how TIFs are created. <clears throat> but generally, you could replace that, that, uh, that diagram with a picture of the mayor's face and then you'd have the answer to how TIFs are created. Uh, so here's the base that we're speaking of. And so the property taxes that come from your bill, if you're property owners and if you're renters, it goes into your property um, owner's uh, bank account and it just gets it to the same place. You know, they fund most of our local government. So uh, if, you, if you should look at your property tax bill, you'll see the Board of Education, the libraries, um, the city colleges, the water reclamation district, the forest preserve, the county of Cook, et cetera, et cetera. You know, just the basic underpinnings of civilization as we know it, really. Uh, other than that, it really doesn't go to much at all. Um, and so that's the base, and those property taxes go to those units of government that rely on their property taxes for operation. The increment, hence tax increment financing, is the increase in value of those properties over the life of a TIF. And in 
This here money, the delta, goes into the tip district. It goes off the, off the chart, follow the little dot, into the pockets of the developers, way over there somewhere, in a, in a very opaque manner. Or you can put it this way, this is for the mayor, and this is for us. And as I said, it's 23 years. Now, there's a lot of tips in the city of Chicago, 32%. No other city in the city in the world has this. In fact, we had a, we had a conference uh, a few months ago, uh, and Richard Dye, who's a professor at this very institution, who has studied TIFs extensively, had this quote. He said, when we, the national experts, sit around talking about tax policy and local government finance, he said, Chicago is this TIF poster child of shame. Poster child of shame. How nice for us that we are recognized you know, for our, our excellent civic values in so many ways. Uh, so 32% of the city of Chicago is in a tip district. As I say, 163 of these bad boys, and another uh, 280 in suburban Cook County for a grand total of 443. And there they are for the whole Cook County. So you see, it's, it's quite a big deal. 85 municipalities uh, in the county of Cook besides us have these things. And you can see the extensive growth. It's quite the growth industry. Uh, and this is, by the way, when Mayor Daley II came into power. And a cynic might conclude that someone inside the Daley camp figured this stuff out pretty fast. And a precipitous 45 degree angle rise from that day to this. And there's the revenue streams enjoyed by TIFs. And even in a down economy, these things are throwing off a lot of money, or as I use the word, extraction, extract. Uh, and so it's, it's quite a bit. We don't have the 2012 numbers yet. They'll be in probably in another month or so. So there's the grand total, uh, 454 for the city of Chicago, 275 for Cook, grand total 729. You know, a billion here and a billion there. It starts to add up. Now, to put it in perspective, this is a chart of all the revenue for the city of Chicago for 2011 from our good friends of the Civic Federation. And it shows that um, of our grand total of uh, about uh, 6.6 uh, 6 billion, property taxes make up $880 million. But that's just what they report. That's on the books. This here money is off the books. So this number and this number is really how much property taxes have been collected by the city of Chicago. So you have to put those two numbers together. And when you do that, you have quite a startling graphic. <clears throat> so this is how much tips have taken since they started in 1986, $5 billion. And this is the graphic. So this is what the civics books tell you, how your property tax is distributed, right? With 54% for the Board of Ed. But tips don't show up on that civics book, do they? But when you ta 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 uh, include the amount of money uh, sucked up by tips, you go with this. 34% are sucked up by tips, which squeezes everybody else. So the Board of Ed does not collect 54%, as you're led to believe. They collect 36%. Now, I think that's a startling number. And to my knowledge, no one has ever reported it before. So now you are in the know. So all that's the big picture, well and good, but what about where you live, you know, where you live in your community? So we asked the question, what are TIFs doing in my ward? And we made that decision for a very important geopolitical psychic reason. Because if I asked you, how is life in the Pulaski Industrial TIF live? You're going to go, huh? That could be Mars, right? But if I said, how's life in Lincoln Park? Or where do you live? Rogers Park. So how's life in Rogers Park live? Pretty good. Pretty good? <laughs> Any complaints? <laughs> could you think of some things to improve in Rogers Park? Sure you can. Sure. Yeah. yeah. All right, so your brain could start working like, you know, that park should be improved. You know what? I, that, that where the beach thing is, that's kind of eroded. And you know what, I was waiting for the bus the other day, and it seemed to be waiting for like an hour. What's up with that? I pay a fair amount of taxes, you know. I'm not complaining, I don't want to be a complainer, but you know what, my kid, do you have kids? I don't have kids. Don't kids, you have friends with kids? 
No friends. You have no friends at all. <laughs> I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> Yeah, they're closing, yeah. right? So, so someone, you know, someone might answer the question. Well, yeah, I have, I have a kid, and, and she goes to the ABC Elementary School, and there's like there's like 40 kids in her class, and you know, I'm not down with that. That's not okay with me. So, you know what I'm saying? Every one of you could go through this exercise and come up with a list of things like, you know, that's uh, not, not so great. And some communities, believe me, you don't have to ask. Things are are really bad in some communities. Um, so that's the question. You know, there is no alderman of the Pulaski tip, right? But there is an alderman for the 27th ward, for the 49th ward, and, and that person should be answerable to us if your complaints are grievous and if your neighbors get together with you and say, you know, you know, Lynn, we agree with you, that sucks, that can't stand. And then, you know, that's a democracy, right? Well, so therefore, that's why we're trying to answer this question on a word-by-word -word basis, but you know what? You can't get it answered. So let's try, shall we? We go to the city's website on this journey to answer our question of what is TIF doing to me where I live? And we start on the home page of Chicago's TIFs. And we see this funky thing, like a spreadsheet, I guess is what it is. And if you click on it, you get taken to this thing. <coughs> and it uh, kind of just goes on forever. <laughs> it's 4,588 rows. So the question is, where am I in that? <laughs> yeah. It's like, am I in row 993? <laughs> or am I in rows 1,020 to 1,042? So should I be looking at those rows? That's not very helpful, but you know, I'm kind of geeky, so I will, I will, I will wrestle with this like a bone, like a dog with a bone. Like I'll try to figure it out. So I go, well, wait a minute, look up there. There's a thing called filter. Now the average person may not know that you're supposed to click on that to get different views. You know, filter, 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 like a coffee filter. You know, I don't know. So okay, go up there and click on that, and you see, oh, I can get the tip name. Something called reporting category, description of the amount. But wait a minute, where's the ward? Where's the community area? You know, there's 77 community areas. I certainly know what they are, but the city of Chicago doesn't seem to know that. So I start to get suspicious. You know, I'm from New York City and I'm suspicious. So when I start to see this kind of stuff, I gotta go, wait a minute. So I'm kind of already, my, my spidey sense is tingling at this point. Um, so I think, well, maybe there's another way in, you know? So I, I go clicking around and I find this map. So it's like, where am I? Am I over here? Am I, am I up in here? Oh, I don't know where I am. This is not helpful to me. Okay, I go to this page. This lists every TIF district, 163. And if you click on these um, words, they open up a PDF. And for those of you geeky folk, you'll know that a PDF is not manipulable. It's kind of a solid lump of, of stuff. And you can open it up and read it, but unless you know some good stuff, you can't do anything with it. You have to translate it manually. Uh, but unless you are really smart, it's hard to do. I mean, there are tools, but the average, we're talking about the average person trying to answer the question, remember, what are tips doing to me? So we're not assuming that you got two PhDs in data science and about five hours to just, you know, we're, we're not assuming that. Okay, all right, so let's try it for yucks. Click on, the, on one of these puppies, open it up, and you get about 50 pages. And they're paginated all weirdly. So they, they start with you know, pages one to five, and then they jump to page 52, and they, so there's no rhyme or reason, but after you read a couple hundred of these things, you begin to figure them out. This is the page that we're looking for. And on this page, we see something called property tax increment. Increment, yes. That's the word we're looking for. That's the revenue. We're looking for the expenditures. How much did this, this uh, bad boy spend? And very interesting, we're looking for something called fund balance. So each of these things has a bank account, boys and girls that has money in it at the end of the year. So, this, so think of it this way, it's like your bank account. Money in, money out, balance at end of year, just like your bank accounts. Hopefully you all have balances at the end of the year. 
So we opened up every one of those things over some beer and pizza with our high-tech operation at Tip Central, looking something like this, manually entering in number, 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 number. And then at the end of the exercise, the wonderfulness of Excel tells you how much is at the bottom of each of these figures. Now prepare to have news. This is news, ladies and gentlemen. You are hearing something that nobody has seen before. At the end of 2011, our tips had $1.7 billion in unspent funds. Where's the collective? <gasps> <Okay. gasps> That's a huge number, right? Aren't we supposed to be broke? Aren't they closing schools, 53 schools? Anybody live near one of them? Yeah? Anybody any, got any kids in, in a closed school that's being closed? Yeah? Mental health clinics closed, library hours closed, shut. CTA on death watch. Who here has had a, 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 a mass transit line cut or terminated that's affecting you? Who here has had a mass transit line cut or, or affecting you? Well, this is an affluent cloud, but I gotta tell you, when we do this community, when we do this in communities of color, everybody raises their hand. Every single person raises their hand and says, it takes me twice as long to get to work, or I can't get to work, okay? How can that be, he wonders, with $1.7 billion? And this is not funny money, this is not magic beans, this is property tax, your property tax, our property tax. So to me, this is a piece of news that is worth shouting from the rooftops. All right, so now the question is, what about your particular ward? Going back to that question. So we started with one ward in question. We started with the 27th ward. Um, and it starts near where I live. I live right here and goes all the way into West Garfield Park. The alderman is the Honorable Walter Burnett, Jr. And there are 12 tips in this, in this board. So the first question is, uh, this is the, the data sets that we needed. You know, it's quite a lot of stuff that we needed to gather to answer this question for you. So, the, so you can start to see the, the sort of the background work that we don't really show anyone. But this is the shape of the ward, and these are the shapes of the tips, you see? And in some cases, there's quite a big tip that just kisses the ward, like that. Other cases, there's a tip that's mostly in the ward, but kind of just goes a little out, you see what I mean? It spills out. And the same here. Now what we have done is create a tool that essentially skims all this off and just looks at that. And not this. And we do that 12 times in order to create the answer of what do tips do in this one particular ward. Now this, to my knowledge, has never been done before. And we get a spreadsheet that looks like this, which again, is not for the public, but it's the underneath the story. This is the, this is the data that we tell the story from. So down here are the lists of the ward, of the tips. Um, these are the total receipts that they took. Uh, the total expenditures, the total amount of money that was at the bank at the end of the year. So you can see the grand total was $398 million. But through our extraction process, we get this number. The total tip take just from the in-ward tips, $36.8 million. And that is represented on your wonderful flyer right here, up in the upper left where it says $36.8 million. That's news. So it has a yellow star on it. That means nobody has ever heard this before. So that's one of the, that's an exclusive from the cup reporters, the crack reporters at the tip, the tip newspapers. So that's news. So the people of the 37th board, uh, the 27th board did not know that. That in one year, tips extracted almost $37 million. Now, what's really interesting is we look at this number and say, okay, if these 12 tips had all this in the bank account at the end of 2011, how much of that came from the 27th war? You'd like to know, I'm sure you would. The answer is $62 million. So that's a number that's never been reported before. So, so look at it this way. If on January 1st, 2012, all the tips had been dissolved, and the money sent back to whence it came, somehow push it back, and each ward would have a little bank account, 
here is your tip money back to you, sir. You left it on the car seat, forgot your money. If good citizens of the 27th Ward would have gotten a bank account of $62 million. So let's repeat that. That's money that came from the property owners of that ward. It didn't come from anywhere else, but it's their money, but it's sitting in a bank account. So now you can imagine, Liv, you're in the 27th Ward, and you do have that list of grievances that you've been talking about to your neighbors. And you go see the right honorable Walter Burger. You know what he's gonna tell you? We're broke. I'm sorry, Liv, I feel you. I know that swing set needs to be repaired. I know there's 40 kids in your class. I know there's no guidance counselors. I know there's no drug testing. I know there's no nothing. Yeah, hey, you give me one minute, but there's only two of us now, right? Oh, well, there's three of us. I guess, I guess we gotta go fast, all right. So we'll just pass through all this other stuff. Um, this is interesting, the, the TIFs uh, took 33% of all the of all the taxes inside the 27th Ward. So that's the news. So this is this is how the distribution of tips look like, the distribution of property taxes look in the 27th Ward. This is how it's supposed to look. This is how it really is. You see a big piece of the pie that tips are taking that don't appear anywhere. Uh, this is the graphic that we produce. We asked for the projects that tips fund. We got basically take a hike. We found our own list of TIF projects that are funded and broke it down for you, which appear here. So 46% of the projects funded by TIFs go to private industry, like $8 million to um, Blommer's Chocolate, $7 million to Roundy's Grocery, and so forth. Um, and there's stories of TIF abuse, which we have no time to talk about, unfortunately. Uh, but this is my favorite now, $26 million for JDL development in the 46th Ward for a luxury high-rise across the street from Lincoln Park, because that's clearly blighted. <laughs> and JDL definitely needs our $26 million to build those condos for these poor yuppies who apparently don't have enough money on their own. And this work has led to tip town meetings. Oh, and uh, there's Valerie Leonard, oh my goodness. <laughs> Uh, so we started with a tip top meeting on February 12th, and that led, has led to an avalanche of tip meetings. There's B. Jasper sitting right over there, I'm giving her a laser beam right now. <laughs> so we've done six tip town meetings since February 12th, and um, there's six more coming. We can't keep up with the demand. Neighbors want to know this information. We produce one of these for everyone, customized for everyone. So if you would like to have your ward illuminated, there's a sale going on. <laughs> Two for one. See me afterwards. Um, we're going to be in Englewood on May 4th for the Englewood TIF. Now this is actually someone's property bill from the Englewood TIF, and you'll see that it says zero. Uh -huh. The TIF says zero. Now, here's a, here's, a, here's a multiple choice for you. What is the true number percentage that the Englewood neighborhood tips take from every single property owner inside this boundary? Is it A, 17%, is it B, 23%, is it C, 44%, or is it D, 68%? To learn the answer, you'll have to join us on May, you can't say. <laughs> Don't see, don't, don't give out the secret. To hear the answer, you'll have to join us in Englewood on May 4th. Thank you very much. So I know this is being cast. Do I have to sit? Can I stand? You can do Garrett, anything you want. Garrett. Yeah. Um, so I, yeah, I'll use the mic. Sorry, I drove down here because so I'm sitting all day, all the time. <laughs> oh. My name is Maria Haddon, and I work with the Participatory Budgeting Project. How's that my placement? Good enough? Yeah, I was going to get that out of your eyes. Oh, okay. you, have, you don't have a slideshow. Um, I have lots of slideshows, but I did not bring a slideshow today. Because like sitting, I use slideshows all the time. Um, so thank you guys for coming out today, and Ipsy, thanks for inviting me to sit on this panel, these wonderful people. Um, so the Participatory Budgeting Project is a nonprofit organization that's actually based in Brooklyn, uh, but I'm our Chicago employee. So 
we uh, very <coughs> simply we help elected officials and community organizations and uh, basically communities as a whole um, decide how to spend public dollars and set up processes that does that. So show of hands, has anyone heard of participatory budgeting? Liv, now that I know you live in the 49th floor, <laughs> this is directed to you. So I'm sorry, this is a big one. So I live in the 49th floor. Does anyone here live in the 46th floor? Show of hands. That's Alderman James Kaplan. Or the 5th floor, Alderman Leslie Harrison. Okay. Um, how about the 45th floor? That's John Arena. Okay, if you don't know what ward you live in, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but I'm going to tell you that. While the city of Chicago's website is really bad for some things, there's a really simple tool in there where you can enter your address and it will tell you what ward you live in and who your alderman is. And if you don't know, go look. But isn't the do you have a challenge report? Um, actually, I don't know if the information on the website is still going to the old maps. I imagine it is because the city of Chicago takes forever to update anything on their website. So you probably don't even have to worry about it. Um, it's probably still the old information. But either way, find out what ward you live in. So here in Chicago, um, the Participatory Budgeting Project and the Great Cities Institute um, within the College of Urban Planning, um, we've worked together to create this project called PV Chicago. So pvchicago.org, uh, you can go to our website, um, is working on bringing participatory budgeting to Chicago. So I'm going to call it PV from here on out because it's easier to say. But so PB is very simply a democratic process in which community members get to directly decide how to spend community dollars. So it's really simple. Lots of syllables, simple concepts. Um, the way that this has kind of worked in the United States so far, which it started in the 49th Ward, which is why I'm giving you a hard time. Um, it started in the 49th Ward in 2009. Um, it spread to four wards in Chicago this year. So this is the first year for PB Chicago. It's practiced in eight districts, eight city council districts in New York City, and the first citywide experience is happening right now in Vallejo, California, which is in the Northern Bay Area. Um, I'm gonna do a little more audience participation here. Um, how many of you, I know you, we all know that we live in a democracy, how many of you feel like you live in a democracy by whatever qualification, show of hands? Like on a daily basis, how many of you feel like you live in a democracy? You get to read a newspaper. Um, on a daily basis, uh, well, I forget, I forget daily. How many of you uh, within, not just the city of Chicago, but maybe wherever you're from as well, how many of you have visited uh, any elected official that represents you? It's not too bad. It's still less than half the room. Um, how many of you have uh, written a letter, even like signed onto an electronic letter to an elected official? Okay, if you want. Um, show of hands, how many of you vote regularly, more or less? Okay, so these are all, you know, kind of things we think of uh, about our democracy, right? So we get to vote, we have elected officials, we have the right to approach our elected officials or write them and ask them to do things, like in our, in our favor, um, we pay taxes, uh, other things that we think of. Um, one of the things that got me interested in participatory budgeting when it came to my ward was that you know, I voted, I'm a regular voter. I had visited my alderman uh, on some issues in the neighborhood that concerned me. I was pretty active in participating in kind of my local neighborhood association and group. Uh, and I felt like I was a, an active kind of democratic citizen in general. Um, but when participatory budgeting came to my ward and I sat in that first little meeting and my alderman said, hey, we have a million dollars that we can spend on infrastructure repairs in the community, and I'm gonna let you guys decide how that money is gonna be spent. When I sat through that presentation and, and kind of left that two hour assembly where I learned about the budget, I learned about what participatory budgeting was, I had met new neighbors, we brainstormed ideas on how we wanted to spend our money, and then I signed up to volunteer to be kind of a community representative for the next few months. I then felt like this is how everything should be done, um, very strongly. So when we talk about democracy and democratic processes and how, how democratic are we and how can we engage and participate in our democracy over these last three years of being able to participate in this in my ward, but also working with an organization to bring this process to other communities, 
Uh, one thing I've noticed is there aren't a lot of spaces. Like as, as many, as many, as great a system as we have, it has its flaws, but for the most part, I'm a big fan of our democratic society. Um, lots of improvements I think could be made, but with all this kind of set up around us for these couple hundred years, I don't know at what point things changed or were lost and what kind of phase we're in now, but I realized after that first meeting that there was no place else where I could actually participate in that way, um, even when I sought it out. So even when I looked for ways within the city of Chicago to have my voice heard or be more actively engaged, not even just to get things that I wanted, but to contribute, um, they, they just didn't exist or they weren't easy to find. So when we, uh, with PB Chicago and kind of the work that we do here, we're finishing up our first year, which next weekend's a big weekend for a lot of things. So next weekend, you can go to the Tip Englewood project, but if you live in one of those four wards that I mentioned, make sure you go and vote in your neighborhood PB process before you head over to Tom's session. Um, so anybody who lives in these wards that are participating and is 16 years of age or older can vote. So you just have to have an address in the ward and be 16. Um, so if you meet those qualifications or someone in your household does, go to your ward website, go to our PB Chicago website. I think by the end of today we should have up like the sample ballots so you can see the types of projects that are going to be on the ballot. Um, but of the things that I've kind of participated in in the 10 years that I've lived in Chicago, um, even though I'm a little biased now, this is definitely the most democratic process that I've been involved in in my relationship to the city. Um, and thinking about you know, moving to Chicago and our relationship with cities, one of the things that I've realized uh, over the last couple of years is that Chicago, in comparison to other cities, but even just kind of in its own bubble, um, the relationship that we as individuals have with our city uh, is often defined through financial terms. It's defined through our, our taxes, what we pay in, and then what kind of services we get back. And um, how many of you are from Chicago? Okay, uh, and then so the rest of you, I'm gonna assume moved here at some point. Um, my first interaction with the city of Chicago, so I'm from Columbus, Ohio. All right, yeah, Columbus, yeah. Um, My first interaction with the city of Chicago, my first couple interactions with the city of Chicago were through penalties. Parking tickets and registration fees, right? So for years, I've lived here for 10 years, and only in the last three have I had any kind of relationship with the city of Chicago that didn't involve me being penalized. <laughs> so you guys laugh, so I'm assuming you can relate to this experience, but so what's wrong with that picture, you know? Like, what would, how could it be different if there were other ways for us to interact with, you know, our city as like an entity versus, you know, our city as like a, a big bad guy, you know, everyone's always taking our money, the parking meters are taking our money, the taxes are taking our money, and you know, we live in kind of this this time of scarcity, like we don't have a lot of resources, and a lot of, I think, our natural inclinations are to kind of close in, um, or to get really angry, right? So we, we get outraged, we get angry, but if we don't have a particular place or outlet uh, to, to direct that, then we get frustrated and eventually those people close in too. Um, we're really trying to push participatory budgeting and similar participatory practices as alternatives to this. So uh, residents and citizens, you need, you need places to interact, you need places to give your opinions, but not just give opinions, but actually be able to act upon them and to do something about them. So PB, as it works, is pretty simple. So in the fall this year in PB Chicago, we started out with a series of public assemblies called neighborhood assemblies. So each of the four wards participating, um, they had some community volunteers and the aldermen and the ward staff. They got together with us. We made some PowerPoint presentations. They shared, um, most of them had a minimum of five and many of them had up to seven neighborhood assemblies. Um, sharing information about what, how they spent their budget. So the budget they're working with is called aldermanic menu money. It's a small budget in proportion to the city of Chicago's total budget. It's only $1.3 million per alderman, um, and it can only be used for physical infrastructure. So it's a little limited in that sense too. But you can still do a lot. It's primarily the only budget that each ward has to repave and improve residential streets. And so it's really important, and, uh, and it's what people see when you think of your ward and how things are. 
we find that it really relates directly to how people perceive that kind of quality of life, you know. Is the bus falling in that pothole? Like, do you have a bus shelter? You know, what's your CTA stop like? Um, what are your roads like? Do you have street lighting? Do you feel safe? Um, are there trash cans? So these kinds of issues that affect us on all our daily basis. So the neighborhood assemblies, you learn about how your alderman spent the menu money for the previous years. So what happens? What's menu money? How can it be used? You learn about participatory budgeting, experiences, and where it's from. So it's from Brazil. It's been around since 1989. There's over 1,500 PD processes around the world. Um, it's most commonly practiced at city levels, but it's also been used in counties and state governments and within like housing authorities and school districts. So there are a lot of broad uses for participatory budgeting. And then as a participant in this neighborhood assembly, you're then asked to break out into small groups, sit down with your neighbors, and brainstorm. So hey, how would you like to see your ward improved? What kind of things are going to make your life better or your child's life better or improve the quality of what your neighbors kind of experience on a daily basis? And then we ask people to volunteer to be community <coughs> representatives, giving them uh, uh, even a further in in participating. So community representatives spend about three to four months working with their neighbors and the ward staff, taking all those initial project ideas and turning them into concrete um, project proposals that then go on a ballot. So we just finished up our, what we call our project expos, where these community representative committees, which typically form kind of around issues like streets um, or you know parks or schools, and they've had a couple assemblies where they've presented back their progress on these projects to the rest of the community. The next weekend is the vote. So they've been working really hard for months on this. Now, decisions made through this voting process will be binding. So the aldermen have all agreed to say, whatever the community decides, we're going to put this forward is how we're going to allocate our dollars. Um, it's exciting. It's different. Um, and it's new. So I've got some cards up here. If you guys are interested or think that a process like this, um, we, we think it's reinventing democracy. And we see a lot of potential for it, not just within Chicago, but around the world. So please take some cards and we can talk about it more later or if you guys have any questions. Um, and please, if you live in one of those wards, <coughs> participate. And if you're interested, sorry Tom, we're having a conference next weekend too. <laughs> so May 4th and 5th, we're having a, a conference uh, also generously supported by Ipsy. So if you love Ipsy events, who doesn't love Ipsy events? Um, we're going to be at Loyola. So it's two days. Um, we're going to be taking tours to visit voting sites as well. So if you're interested in observing the vote in progress, also come and see me. Thank you. Hi, my name is Valerie Leonard. I am with the Lawndale Alliance. I have lived in Lawndale all my life. And I want to share with you some of the lessons that we've learned in, I guess, as close as what we'll find to democracy in an area where there's very little democracy. Um, we're a group of residents that have come together basically to address issues of concern in the community. The way we got started is the last piece of land that was to be tipped in North Lawndale was in our backyard. And the more questions we asked, the more questions we had, and the more we realized that we were really 
not dealing so much with democracy and development. Okay, and we're here today to share some of the ways that we have engaged people in an area where there's not much community engagement. We have significantly low voter turnout with the exception of the election of President Barack Obama. We also have instances where we have to coach people or coax people to run for offices like the LSC because we've really gotten to a point where people wonder what's the point? Does my voice matter? You know, our voices have been squelched that much. It's gotten to a point where people are like, well, you know, we pay taxes, but they're still not listening to us, and we had to change that. Um, when we look at the work that we've done around TIFFs, you know, back in 2007, again, we came together, and we started analyzing the Ogden Pulaski TIF. We looked at all 358 pages of the TIF redevelopment degree agreement, and we analyzed it, looked at the pros, looked at the cons. How did it work for us? How did it not work for us? We noticed that there were going to be a significant number of people being displaced as a result of the implementation of the TIF. Um, at some point, we could have lost at least 1,200 residents. Um, as a result of the implementation of the TIF, we found that there were a number of errors in the, the properties that could be potentially displaced. We also noticed that they were going to develop the equivalent of uh, one Jewel and Osco store, 300 units of housing, but yet they wanted to acquire, using TIF funds, about 1,700 lots. Now, I went to Chicago Public Schools, but I don't think you need 1,700 lots, vacant lots, in order to do that scale of development. Clearly, there was something else they weren't sharing with us. Um, as a result of that advocacy, we were actually able to get the corrections done such that they were only going to acquire 600 lots, listen to me, only. But you know, you have to look at the fact that Bondo has um, 1,700 or more vacant lots. So they were only going to acquire 600 vacant lots in order to do that development. And then they were only going to displace about 20 some odd, uh, 24 uh, pieces of housing. So we were able, as a result of that democracy, that um, action to, to reduce the impact. Um, ever since then, we've been hosting annual TIF town hall meetings. We've been advocating for a TIF advisory council. In the absence of a TIF advisory council, we started reporting ourselves um, to the ward to the community how much money was in each TIF. There are seven TIFs that impact North Lawndale. We would give a profile for every TIF telling you how much money came in, how much money reportedly went out, what projects, what the goals and objectives were, um, the increase in property values, the percentage of the funds that were actually going to the TIF versus the city, that kind of thing, and then uh, making recommendations going forward as to what we thought could be done to improve the TIFs. And we also developed, working with local residents, a website that tracks every TIF in North Lawndale. So we pulled information from the city, some of the stuff that you saw in Tom's presentation. We have links to that as it relates to North Lawndale because you can see that's very, very hard to navigate unless you really understand or even have a passion for that kind of thing. And we pulled all of that stuff and, you know, uh, as it relates to North Fondo, put it on our website. It's called North Fondo TIFFs. When it comes to mortgage foreclosure, uh, North Lawndale is probably ranked two or three in terms of mortgage foreclosure in the city, depending on um, what study you look at. And so we've been very hard hit with mortgage foreclosure. And one of the things that we do is we have an annual meeting to share with people the state of housing and the mortgage foreclosure issue. Um, back in, I don't want to say about three or four years ago, when there was a big push to do the neighborhood stabilization fund, where you took that money, well, you took HUD money to actually invest in HUD houses and you know, redevelop them for affordable housing, we noticed that the city was using our demographic to get the money, but when it came down to actually distributing the funds, 
we got a disproportionately low amount. In fact, we only got like investments in six properties. And the more questions we asked, the more runaround we got. And we kept on and kept on. And we said, okay, you're not gonna give us the answers that we need. So we started researching ourselves and we demanded that they do a public meeting at um, city council to give an accounting of that $153 million that came back to the city but didn't come to our community even though they were using our demographic in Lawndale to justify it. And what we do at the community level is every year give an accounting of that money, at least as the city reports it. We've also worked with redistricting. As you know, the city, the state, and the county just went through a redistricting process. The city is now being sued. But we work more so on the state level. We had town hall meetings sharing with people in the community what the redevelopment process, what, re, I'm sorry, redistricting process was, um, how that worked, sharing with them how to navigate the census.gov website and how that related to redistricting. And then we worked with elected officials as well. Some of our elected officials only came out for that. We don't see it, haven't seen it since, but, <laughs> but at any rate, that's another discussion. Education, uh, we're at ground zero for school closings. As you know, there are 53 schools on the list slated to be closed. Five of those schools are in North Lawndale. At one point, there are 129, and we had uh, t about 12 schools. And so we're very, very concerned about that. And we also, on an annual basis, do a state of education to let people know what's going on with our schools, letting them know what's going on at the policy level, the finances, and you know, all that good stuff. And one thing we're really proud of, we worked to, to get an, a referendum on the ballot this past fall for the elected school board, got that ward wide, and the measure passed 89%. Mm -hmm. um, the technology that we use in order to support our efforts, pretty common, you know, not, not anything that requires rocket science, um, blogs, Twitter, you know, Twitter to keep people engaged, Facebook, LinkedIn, Scribd email, conference calls, we even use online surveys, use SurveyMonkey as a tool, we use Can TV, uh, their live streaming, as well as the, the television shows, we use YouTube, and every block Chicago, even though that is now you know, no longer available. I wanna share with you some of the work we're doing around education, especially as it relates to school closings. We put together an alternative plan for school closures in North Rondell, network with our elected officials, a number of organizations, and this was back in March. At this time, the, at the time, these schools were all on the closure list, a um, significant number. What we did was we tapped into the work that the Community Advisory Council was doing, and what Community Advisory Councils are, the CPS has, in a, in a few communities, maybe six, maybe 12 communities, uh, local community advisory councils where they provide advice supposedly into community-based education plans. What we have found for us in Mondale, you know, each community is different, but for us it's been more or less um, us defending ourselves against school closures. There hasn't been any time for any planning or any forward thinking and all that good stuff. Uh, what we did do is we worked with the Community Advisory Council who worked directly with schools to come up with plans as to how they were going to improve their own environs. And then we, as this committee to save North Lawndale schools, we've tried to figure out ways that we as a community could support the work that was going on. So basically we would have a partnership threefold. We would have the schools and the Community Advisory Council, again, they will focus on school improvement kinds of things inside the building. And we, who were the Committee to Save North Rondell Schools, we would focus on aligning community services to support you know, better outcomes for our children. 
And you know, we looked at um, different areas. I know you can't read this. Um, we have a number of areas, arts and culture, truancy prevention, um, early childhood development. There are a number of areas, and you know, I'll make sure that you get copies of this, uh, get access to this um, presentation. But what we were looking at is ways that we could align. There are over 200 organizations in North Lawndale, organizations and churches that engage in some sort of activity that we could use to support our children. And at the same time, we also have relationships with other institutions citywide. So the goal was to align these services along these different sectors with the goal of actually improving student outcomes. And the collaboration would look more or less like this. You know, we obviously analyzed the situation and that's what that arrow is. You know, we looked at the fact that you know, truancy is one of our number one issues. And as a result of truancy, you know, children encounter all kinds of issues um, juvenile delinquency, that schools don't get the funding that they need. You know, if empty schools is a problem, you know, why not work on keeping the children there? And given what our issues were, you know, what were the kinds of things that we would need in order to be successful in making sure we had positive outcomes for our children? So we looked at things like staff and, and other inputs um, that would be necessary. And then we also looked at ways, okay, bear with me. You know, we looked at outputs. What are some of the things that we produce? So we look at our own programs. We looked at the things that we were already doing, youth programs, after school programs, okay, and mentoring. And then we looked at long-term and short-term goals and objectives and our outcomes. So the long-term goal is to actually produce better educational outcomes for our children. And then we structured this model in such a way that there's ongoing evaluation and we will actually structure the evaluation process from the beginning rather than trying to back into a process. And then we established a time frame here. We thought that we could get this done in a, within about a year, planning and um, implementation. And we thought it would take you know, roughly $322,000 startup. You know, we believe it'll take a lot more to do this effectively when you have 24 elementary schools and four high schools. But we thought as a start, we would need about $322,000. This would include, you know, an executive director. It would include people who would actually organize the different resources within the school. And then also look at other ways that the school building could be used beyond just classrooms. And in terms of, you know, how, how do we let people know about this? How do we promote? We, we did um, media alerts. We obviously faxed them, we emailed them, but we also use internet and uh, we use Twitter and Facebook to promote this as well. So this is a copy of a press alert that we did. And here's a copy of a flyer that we put in PDF as well as JPEG so that we can promote it on Facebook and Twitter. And then here's a copy of a flyer. Again, we did this in JPEG as well as PDF so that we could promote this. We are par partnering with Ed VK, Educational Vi Village Keepers, to do a show where every week we focus on school closings and invite people to share their perspectives from all over the city. And finally, any questions that you have, and I'm sure you'll have to be million, there's my phone number, there's my email, and then I'll make sure that you guys have access to this online. Okay. Working, you know, sort of in the trenches in, in Lawndale, you know, 
<laughs> yeah, first of all, we need to actually increase the access to technology. Um, about five years ago, only about 25% of our folks had access to, to the internet. And now we've gotten to a point where a whopping 35% have access to the internet. So clearly we have a long way to go. And one of the things that we envision, though we've not done it yet, is actually, I, I guess, coaxing people to become more tech savvy. And that would be through doing things like webinars, you know, in addition to the city, well, in, in addition to the town hall meetings, actually having electronic town hall meeting via webinar so people can start getting a little bit more comfortable and hopefully create a demand for the information so that people actually begin to use it. How do you make sure that people are not um, widgets or make sure that people don't become so engaged in the technology so that they're no longer human? I, I think we need to, you still gonna have to, I think, engage in things like civil disobedience every now and then, protest every now and then. Twitter, I think, is a good mechanism to help support those kinds of efforts. And you know, we should not get to a point where all we're doing is webinars and <laughs> and not you know not think about the human element. And then when you live in a community like North Lawndale, where there's so many seniors, and the seniors are the ones who are probably most engaged, it doesn't really makes sense, in my opinion, to, to do everything on technology. We still need people. So my question is actually for Liv. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a very tough topic. So maybe, maybe it's two parts. So I'm wondering uh, how this is being used so far in the communities where you've presented these, um, and how you would hope they'd be used in your ideal world. And then also, what are, what are the type of tools have you guys been creating so far in your specific laboratories? Well, it's been all we can do to, to get this far. Um, each meeting is ginned up by a, a group of people, a different group of people from the community, and some have a lot of experience in organizing, and some have never organized. So for some people, this is a whole civic uh, story unfolding. How do you, you know, how do you talk about this? How do you get people to a room? How do you arrange the room? Sound system. I mean, they have to do everything. Uh, so that is a huge accomplishment just in itself. But then people say at the end of the meeting, what do we do now? So I, as an organizer, say, well, what do you want to do? I mean, what, you know, where, where do you want to go? And um, well, in one case, in the seventh and eighth wards, they are getting together to walk the ward. So this is one, so one potential solution that would be super participatory. So they would bring together, so there was, it, 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 the organizers of this particular meeting, there's a woman who was stringing together all the block clubs in that ward. Then another woman was the uh, like the business council, you know, the, the small business groups. And then there's another person who was a, a, a different kind of organizer. So they had not worked together, but so what they're going to do now is bring all their constituents together and create a grid to cover the seventh ward in over, say, a month. But the fun part is getting everyone together in the room and decide, well, what do we want to look at? So let's look at the infrastructure, let's look at schools, let's look at the parks, etc. And what is the rubric? So what does an A look like for us, for parks? So they might say, Oh, okay, well, you know, according to the National Trust for blah, 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 you know, there should be X number of, uh, of land, you know, parkland per thousand. So let's see what we have. Oh my God, it sucks. So that could be their thing. And so on. They would have to go through each of those and then give out their room, their sheets, and they go walk the ward. And then they come back together and share their collective knowledge and then award the ward a group. Great. So we, the citizens of the seventh ward, declare this ward a D. And here's our rationale. Now what we want to do, and this is where seeking funds for this, is to create an online tool that would be, overall that could be uploaded. So we're already crowdsourcing people 
just using Google Docs, where people come to this and they look at this, you know, and they go, what is Nanolink? You know, that's all the information we have and an address. So the crowdsourcing is begun by people hitting these essentially line items on a spreadsheet. And then what we want to do is have you go to that address, take a picture, call the guy on the phone, hey, Nanolink, you got $2 million, what'd you do with it? You know, like a where's Roger? But, wow. But the, the, the walking the ward thing takes it to a much bigger level. Um, and so now, imagine this is a meeting where everyone has come together and had issued their, their grade to the ward. Now that's only half of it. The other half is what's missing. So you all just finished walking the ward. You're all full of information and, and anger and, and whatever. But the fun part is what do you want to see in the ward that is missing? from your experience. Now, what's the top two things? You know, and I say think big. Don't think no million dollars, that's jump change. What do you want in your ward? Is it another school? Is it an L stop? Is it more parks? You know, that's what you take to these all of them and say, you know what, we don't care how you do it. Tip it, pull it out of your <laughs> ear, you know, bond it, we, you know, we, the citizens of the seventh ward, demand this thing this year, and we got this thing next year. And you know what? In 2015, it's time to fire your ass if you have not produced these things. Because that's, in the end, the participatory whatever has to be backed up with politics. So if you don't do the work to imagine your ward, to give yourself, you know, to give the, the alderman a shopping list, then, you know, They'll do whatever the damn, you know, they'll do whatever the mayor says to do. You know, you'll get what you get, whatever that is. But, but after that, if they don't satisfy you, you have to be prepared to act. So the other answer to your question is we are doing um, uh, tools called apps for activists. So that's the, that's the second division of the mighty city lab. <laughs> empire where coders are trying to answer the question of organizers, what is your pain point? Things that you do all the time that can be solved with technology and the very simple and boring tool that we're building is called Sign Me Up, which would allow um, uh, people who come to large public meetings, rallies and such like, to use SMS text to simply say to the organizer, I am here, and exchange email so that Basically, you would you would see signs at a rally that say "Test N O W A R the three one two blah 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 blah," and the, the speakers from the podium would basically say, "Thanks for coming to my rally, to our rally. Take out your cell phones. Let us know you're here. Text three one two blah blah blah." The participant would get an email message back saying, "Thanks for attending our rally. Please email, text us your email." So it's essentially two two steps, well three steps. The first step is you physically came to the meeting. The second step is you text the smart code. And the third is you text your email. So it's a triple opt-in. And believe me, as an organizer, if you've done all that, you want to be with us. We want to be with you. If, you. if you've done all that, we need to know who you are. And after all, the whole point of this is not to have meetings <laughs> and to have these conferences where we're talking to each other. I've done like 500 of these things. I'm sick of it. What I need is people who are ready to act. Is the app available now? No, it's, in, it's not even alpha. It's like whatever's before alpha. It's just being tested. <laughs> it's all volunteer stuff, too. We're looking for coders, by the way. So if there's any civic coders out there, you know, and who could build front-end web presence that would make these things really available to the, to the public, it would be great. Here from DC, we have a large civic tech scene in DC, and I would, I would, we haven't seen anything like the kind of work that you're doing here come out of it. Um, what you get is apps like, where can I get fresh kale on Saturday? Oh, or how do I report the potholes? Um, or, yeah. or, or even worse, right? Apps that really help people who are coming into the city become more powerful. Yes. And so I wonder if you can speak to, as specific as possible, like. What do you do to make sure that these technical, technological conversations are not just including people, you know, at the table, but actually going to where people are and, and taking direction from them? So the question is, how do you make sure that that happens? As organizers, as yeah, as leaders, so, or by by going to where people are. 
right? It's always the million dollar question is how do you get people, how do you get the people who need the most help involved in your process, right? And that's always what we want to know. That's always what I think everybody at this table and in this room who's ever tried to organize anything, it's always your bottom line question. How do you get the people that, that either your community that you're a part of or that the community you're targeting involved? And the answer is, is simple, it's just not very effective. Um, you go to where they are, and it takes time, and you build. Um, one of the lessons learned as we talk about kind of technology for participatory budgeting and its nation kind of stages here in the U.S., one of the things that we, that we lack, that we're looking for, is in order to scale up and make things bigger, technology is really important, right? So in order to move beyond, especially if we, like right now we've got four wards here, and eight districts in New York. But especially if we're looking at doing more wards and more districts or bigger budgets, mm -hmm. as soon as you kind of cross that barrier and move to different things, having, like we have a website, we use, you know, a lot of kind of Google Docs and shared docs and things to try and make things work. But even coordinating that, we have two people coordinating that here in Chicago mm -hmm. with four wards, it's impossible, right? Mm -hmm. It's like a huge task and it's really basic things with technology. But with all the different skill levels and the different communities and it's only gonna get like yeah. like a wider kind of scale, it always comes down to what? And one of the big solutions that we keep coming back to is um, one of the things, that, as I mentioned, like how there are no spaces for people to participate. We don't know how to participate in things. People don't. They we're not taught how to do this. We're not taught how to take control or how to learn how to do these things. And one of the big, by design, some might say, um, one of our big answers just going through this first year in PB Chicago is, we need to offer more training, not just on participatory budgeting and not just on budgets, actually, but we need to have like leadership training and facilitator training and find those partners who were there already in communities to do these things for communities so that when, when the options to participate become available that we're all working to provide, right? So we're like, hey, we provided this thing. You can come participate. You can come vote. You can come learn how you can, like, you know, get your TIF dollars to work for you. But finding that audience, you have to, you have to train them. You have to build them. I think that's a great, a great question. Um, what you describe is what I call civic jewelry. Um, and these hacks that are sponsored mostly by the city and what I call insider agencies are fashion shows for developers, for potential employers. They have no utility in the community whatsoever, really. Um, and I've been to quite a few of them, and I've actually begged them. I mean, I've been on my knees in front of these people. But these guys are super talented. I say guys, mostly guys. Uh, they're super talented, and they are in demand. I mean, so every for-profit business would like a developer for an app. You know, it's hot. And every nonprofit in the universe wants an app, you know. Um, so I'm just one of many little birds in the nest with their mouth open and my hand out with nothing to give these guys to say, come and code for, for, for the community, you know, because some activist somewhere, you know, needs to do their job better. That's of very low interest to these coders. And when you think about it, a lot of the coders are rootless, young-ish. They don't know Lawndale. They don't know... Um, the history of housing justice, and why would they? You know, so some of them care about making data useful. I'll give them that, and that's good. And uh, someone like me and, and, and us, we're trying to find those folk and seduce them, frankly, because we have no money, you know, to, to code for us, really. So it's a huge problem, and, um, you know, when I go to 1871, I see everyone up in there who want to be the next Google, they, they're looking, they got dollar signs for eyes. Money, it's very, it's very seductive, that whole environment. I think it's really, it's really corrosive and abhorrent to me, even though it was made with public money. It's another one of my pet peeves. But thinking big about a tool, I dream of a participatory budget for the entire city of Chicago, in which 100,000 people Pull it, to pull it apart, line item by line item, in which, say, teams of 50 to 100 people take housing, healthcare, youth, they just take it, aviation, because there are people who love aviation and they'll know everything about that department, and they're already out there who have native expertise, but we gotta pull them together in physical space like this, in an online, 
and train them virtually in place and have them do their work on a nine month cycle. So basically, these teams interrogate the, bi the budget line item by line item and in so doing, actually visit the spaces and verify that the people are actually working there. So when they get to the housing department, it says warming center. What is that? There's six of them. Mr. Jones, Mrs. Mrs. Parika, Mrs. Rodriguez, we go and visit them. Where is Mrs. Jones? If she's not there, she gets flagged as a ghost employee, and that shows up on the dashboard. If the commissioner of housing refuses to answer our questions, he gets flagged as an obstructor. He gets a thousand emails. He gets his faxes flooded. He gets on TV. He gets on YouTube. Mr. Mr. Jones, Mr. Commissioner, will you take our call now? And you just work through that. And at the end of the ninth month period, everyone presents their findings in a People's Budget Congress and you present that to your automatic candidates. So the people of Chicago can interrogate the budget that's given and they can create their own. Okay, Tom, I'm gonna to play devil's advocate. I live in Lawndale. Only about 30, 35% of us have computers access to the internet. Mm -hmm. I would argue that that's a wonderful idea you just gave us, but we would be actually locking out 75% of the people from that process if you, if everything is done online. So how do we make up for, for the fact that there's some people don't have the feelings? All right, so as part of the ginning up to this, knowing that that is absolutely the reality in Chicago, we have to supply the missing computers. Now how do we do that? Well, we recycle, we rebuild, or how about this? We build our own. <clears throat> so, um, you know, there are computers that you can build for $30. There's Linux and other software that's free and open source. So um, what if the commitment was, as the ginning up to this process, we, we say, okay, who needs a computer? We need 5,000 computers, whatever, you know, and we need the training. So that's part of the work. So that people, and, and these computers can be used for obviously for commerce and for their, you know, for their leisure and for their career advancement. I mean, you know, how to write a resume, how to use Word. All that stuff is useful knowledge. And I would, I would imagine that if we had a giveaway at Computer Day in Lawndale that was well advertised, and basically you show up, and even if you had to pay $10, and you would get a working computer with a manual and the training, and, and you know, to say, you know, we are available to you. Now, that's, these are jobs for kids, so you get kids to, to, to service these things. So, you know, you have to back it up and think. But no, absolutely, it's a five-year project. But, but we have the tools, and we have the right for this. This is our money. It's our information. And the time has come for us to take control of the situation, because if we leave it up to these, these uh, huckleberries, these rubber stamp all of them, they're going to be running these games on us since the tower cows come home, and we'll be putting these things up at bogus projects forever. And, and Valerie will be back here next year with more sad stories. Yeah, just one point. As you were talking, I was thinking about Can TV. You know, is there some way to integrate television? I'm not a techie, obviously. Mm -hmm. Television with Why the not? internet, yeah. and then that way you don't have to worry about buying computers wow. and people it's already have cable. Box. You can get one for about 150 bucks. Connects to your TV and it acts like a computer. Yeah. So those are these are great. I mean, you know, the, the technology is there, and, and Can TV I think is still in the 70s, frankly. Uh, so I think that's a great, a great challenge. 